Last week, I had the privilege of an intelligent and charming young lady helping me in my research lab. We were preparing a lot of apparatus for an experiment which may run for more than a year. I asked her what were the two most important decisions she would ever make. With almost no delay, she said, who I will share my life with. Then she seemed lost for the other decision. So I broke the silence with, who you marry is the second most important decision you'll ever make. The most important decision is what you will do with Jesus Christ. She smiled and said, oh, I'm not at all religious. Questions of religion don't really concern me. I told her, I don't think religion has much to do with it. That morning, a friend had sent me a video, a testimony by a Hezbollah jihadist called Afshin Javid. I told her a little about it and said I'd like to show her the video. You were born in Iran. Correct. You were a Hezbollah fighter for three years. Correct. I was on my way to the United States to convert Christians into Islam. And um, I had 30 illegal passports at that time. I was arrested, uh, put in jail in Malaysia. I was a uh, dedicated Muslim. Not only prayed the prayers, but I read the Quran once every 10 days, cover to cover. So I was very dedicated. In my time in jail, uh, one day as I'm praying, a man appears in front of me, normal size, but his being shines like light. And this light was not a normal light. This light carried identity in it. You knew that he is holy and he is just. And instantaneous, I knew I am not. Even though I had prayed so many prayers, even though I had fasted so much and I had read the Quran and I had volunteered to walk on landmines, or I had participated in hanging people, trying to please Allah. I knew, even though I have kept all the rules and regulation of Islam, I knew I'm not just, and I'm not holy. And I knew the only just thing for him to do is to kill me. But I didn't want to die, so I ran to the corner of the room, literally held my head in my arms and just cried out shouting, Forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. And I didn't think he will forgive me because he is just. Till I felt a touch on my left shoulder. And he said, I forgive you. And I felt a weight just lifted off me. And I, I, I knew I'm forgiven, but I don't know how. And I was confused. I was like, Okay, I don't understand. Only God can forgive. You just forgave me. You are God. But you are a different God than the one I have studied about. This is not Allah. So who are you that forgives me and I feel forgiven today? And he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I thought, that's very powerful. It means a lot because as a Muslim, you pray, show me there is a straight path kind of thing. And so the way is a direction, truth is something you measure, life is a source, but he claims to be all those three. I never thought the way is a person, the truth is a person, and life is a person, and all of them is the same person. So I said, I don't understand. What is your name? And he said, Jesus Christ. And Someone grabbed all my bones out of my body. I just fell like a piece of meat to the ground, and I just began to weep. It's like, you know, being colorblind. And then suddenly you see colors again. And you realize the world is so much more beautiful than you ever thought. If you ask me what made the world so colorless, it's the hatred, the anger that is in the heart of every Muslim. I mean, I, people say, why did you hate the Jews? I had never met a Jew. 
And I thought Hitler was a good man for doing what he did. He just didn't finish the job. I don't know why I hated them. No Jew had ever done anything bad to me. God didn't design us to hate. Didn't design us to want to see someone dead. The fact that he was a zealous Muslim was suddenly a minor issue. What's important is what do you do with Jesus Christ, no matter what your religion. Until I was 33 years old, I was an atheist. Many atheists today claim that atheism is not a religion. I can't remember if I ever claimed that. I don't think so. But it's certainly not true. My atheist friends and I had our cherished gurus like Bertrand Russell and Magnus Pike and we learned all the atheistic dogma we could cram into our deceived brains. But when Jesus Christ showed me, suddenly and dramatically, that a life which rejects the way, the truth and the life is a miserable, lonely road to dusty death, the fact that I was an atheist, content with my life of sin, became irrelevant. All that mattered was what was I going to do with Jesus Christ. About 15 years later, I was invited to join the Science and Religion Forum, which met at the University of South Africa. It consisted of a lot of theologians and a few scientists who were Christians. I soon discovered that the aim was to find ways of interpreting the Bible so that it would fit in with the pronouncements of secular science. Time and again I would point out that science does not contradict what the Bible clearly says. It's only the assumptions, the just-so stories and the unproved hypotheses of secular scientists that contradict the Bible. I was ignored, and they carried on with their schemes to bring in evolution billions of years, and astronomy based on the Big Bang into harmony with the truth of the Bible. Eventually, they stopped inviting me to their meetings. The professor, who was the leader of the forum, wrote a textbook in which he spent a surprising amount of time explaining what a fool Philip Stott is for believing the Bible. It really didn't matter that those theologians were professional Christians who spent their time training up a new generation of professional Christians to pastor Christian churches. What mattered is what they did with Jesus Christ. Jesus said, Had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? Well, they did what almost all the theologians and many of the Christians I've met do with Jesus. They ignored him. They believed what atheists, who call themselves scientists, say. They regard the things God instructed Moses to write after 80 days and nights of face-to-face -face instruction on Mount Sinai as nonsense. They consider the writings of Moses to be ancient Babylonian myths, stories invented by ignorant goat herds who knew no better. While I was still a part of the Science and Religion Forum, I met one or two of the theologians who took part in the Jesus Seminar. That was a meeting where theologians read passages of Scripture and voted on whether they were true or not. A really high-profile council of leaders of the Christian church. And what did they do with Jesus? They set themselves up to judge him. He'd said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. An awful lot of his words were summarily thrown out as untrue by these religious leaders of our day. Saul of Tarsus was a devoutly religious Jew. He studied the Torah under Gamaliel. He hated the Christians and set out for Damascus to punish 
and imprisoned the Christians who'd fled there. But before he reached Damascus, he met Jesus Christ. All his religious zeal melted away. He stopped persecuting Christians and he became a new man. Sundar Singh was a devout follower of the Sikh religion, which in his days was a sect of the Hindu religion. It's now been declared a separate religion. Little Sundar was sent by his wealthy father to a mission school to learn English. He very soon came to hate the Christian staff, who he regarded as just proud purveyors of Western culture. He hated the Christian religion and the Bible passionately. One day he publicly burnt a Bible page by page to demonstrate this hatred. But he became doubtful about the truth of his own religion. He became obsessed with discovering the truth about God. He couldn't find the truth he was looking for and decided that he would kill himself by lying down on the railway track in front of a train. While preparing to go to the railway line, he met Jesus. His life was transformed amazingly. He immersed himself in the Bible. He gave up all he owned except a blanket, a New Testament, a robe and a turban, which were the traditional dress of a Hindu monk known as a sadhu. He journeyed barefoot over wide reaches of India, Pakistan and Afghanistan, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He walked barefoot through the snow of the Himalayas to take the gospel to Tibet, where he was mistreated mercilessly for his witness. He made so many converts and became so famous throughout the world that many books were written about him. The fact that he started out as a devout Hindu and a passionate Bible hater meant nothing when he met the Lord Jesus Christ. All that matters was what he did with the Lord Jesus Christ. In episode 82, we met a preacher and theologian typical of very many Christians. Christians who have vastly more trust in what the secular scientists of our day say than what the Word of God says. The universe was created 13.8 billion years ago. They almost all agree on that. And it was created out of a singularity that is smaller than an atom. And that in a moment of time, something happened. They don't know what. But something happened, and there was an explosion of some sort. And moving faster than the speed of light, the universe came into existence. Now, our universe is 94 billion light years across. And this, what we have right here, and quoting Science Weekly, this is a picture of the radiation left over from the Big Bang. Light traveling at 186,000 miles per second. It would take 94 billion years to travel from one side of the universe to the other side of the universe. But you know, generally speaking, the world thinks most Christians are brain dead. You know, they think that we don't know anything. And, that, and you know, we send our kids off to school, and I've got several grandkids in college. And when they come back, and if, if I tell them that everything that was created was created in, in six 24 hour periods, and before that there was nothing, and that outer space was just created old instantly. They start looking at Grandpa like Grandpa doesn't really know anything. But as we saw in episode 89, all the secular science he'd put his faith in had collapsed into the dust. The Big Bang, with its vast distances and timescales, now has the credibility of a fairy tale. His revered astronomical gurus were even wrong about what the sun is. It's almost certainly liquid, not gas, and it's looking more and more likely that it's actually made of metallic hydrogen. It became clearer and clearer that what Hoyle said, the creation of the universe, like the solution of the Rubik's Cube, 
requires an intelligence, is undeniable. The creation of the heaven and the earth in just six days by a powerful and super-intelligent creator looks far more credible than vast amounts of time turning nothing into everything all by itself. But the really important thing is, what will we do with Jesus Christ? Will we accept what those wise with the wisdom of this world say, especially if they call themselves scientists? Or will we listen to him? I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.